Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. morning again. We can often think about the way we would hope or anticipate something we, in the way it would go. The ideals. The things that we'd say, okay, this is the ideal way for this to happen. So, I want you to think for a moment, what would be your ideal vacation? Your ideal vehicle. Maybe the ideal meal you could have, somebody could make for you. Maybe what's your ideal plan for Christmas and how that would happen? Now, if we went around the room, how many people do you think would have the exact same answer to every question? Probably unlikely. Some people might even disagree with the person sitting next to them, which in some cases could involve some conflict. Um, Maybe you have uh, a vacation that would be ideal would be going somewhere warm where you can sit on the beach. Or maybe you'd prefer to stay home and work on house projects. Maybe your uh, ideal vehicle might be different based on what stage of life you're in. Maybe your favorite meal is something simple, something straightforward you can make for yourself, or maybe it's something more elaborate that you need to hire somebody to make for you. Or maybe your Christmas, you know exactly how it's going to go and you have it already planned out, or you're the type of person who will figure out what you're doing for Christmas the day before. Ideals. Perfect plans. In a perfect world, we wouldn't start having to watch Hallmark movies until after Remembrance Day. (laughs) Such is not the case in my house. (laughs) I told her I was going to say that. She's like, how are you going to work that in? I told her I could. (laughs) Yeah, I Now I'm in trouble. <laughs> this is not going ideal right now. No. Uh, right, we all have ideals. We all have things that we would hope that things would be. We go, okay, this is what would be what I think is best or perfect or right in this situation. And in these matters, right, our vacation, what vehicle we drive, what we eat, what we do for Christmas... We have flexibility. What we do in one family is different from the next, and nobody typically gets too upset about it. But when we talk about the church, things get a bit different. We all have this ideal picture of how we expect things to be. And when somebody's idea of what church should be is different from ours, it can create tension. It can create challenges. It can create opportunities as we seek to work together. This morning, as we continue in our journey through our statement of faith and what we believe, we've come to the the matter of the church. What do we believe about the church? What is our understanding of the purpose of the church? How this, the church, is to function together. Now, under our statement of of faith, there is six actually sub-points on the church. The most, I think, of any of the uh, items we will deal with in the statement of faith. One of them has to do with the two ordinances of the church, uh, baptism and communion. And though we typically celebrate communion on the first uh, Sunday of a month, you'll note it's not on the table up front. Somebody did not forget with the time change. Um, We moved it to next week as we will be talking about the ordinances next week. And so it only seemed right to um, have it function that way that we would discuss the ordinances, and then celebrate communion uh, together. And then the the last two deal with the Christian's duty and mission. And that is going to be a separate sermon two weeks from now. 
And so our focus this morning is going to fall on kind of what is the church? The four points that kind of touch on, on that matter. And as we we'll look at what our statement says, before we get there, I want to look at the passage that, that Josh read for us this morning. Because I think it highlights very importantly what the call of the church is. What the call of the church is. Paul is writing to uh, the church of Ephesus. And uh, you'll remember from last week, uh, for those who's here with us for our 25th celebration, uh, Pastor Rob, um, uh, he had spoken on this passage. He'd explained, uh, the one right before it, pardon me, uh, the kind of end Paul's prayer for strength for the church. Uh, his prayer for those in Ephesus and, and what he wanted, that he, they would be able to do much more than what they could think of themselves instead of what God could do, which was immeasurably more. And Paul reminded that as they did that, there was an important mark that should be in the nature of the life of the church. And so Paul touches on two aspects of what he says here. First, he encourages them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Paul has um, been laying out for them who they are. He has established with them their identity, that they were called by God, that they have been given an identity in Christ, that God has revealed who he is to them, both those who were Jews and those who were Gentile who were kind of mixing together in Ephesus, he's given them this idea of who they are. He reminds them that they were chosen before the foundation of the world, that they would be holy and blameless. He reminds them that it is a spirit at work in them that they are able to do all that they would desire to do. And so Paul then reminds them, urges them, gives them this straightforward imperative that they are to walk then worthy of that calling. Paul, using the typical term for walk, is the journey of life. Each of us are on a journey. Joyce was talking about change, things that were different. The way we were a number of years ago is different than what we know, what we do, how we function now. Because we've grown We've learned. We've adjusted. 25 years ago, I was seven years old, so definitely wasn't pastoring then. Um, We're different. We change over time. We experience life, and and how we look at things changes. We are thankful that God does not change, that his word does not change, that his word has always been the same. We learn. We grow. We deepen our understandings. So Paul is saying, as you've been through this journey, to continue in that. Don't stop learning. Don't stop growing. Don't stop experiencing all that God has for you to continue in that. And as you continue it, be worthy of that. The word worthy means consistent with or matching. Consistent with or matching. He's saying... You have this calling. Be consistent in that. Don't be wavering doing one thing once and then another thing another time and kind of flopping back and forth. But be consistent with the identity that he's established in Christ Jesus for them. To walk in that. To do well in that. Now the term calling is one that uh, can sometimes be a buzzword that people use. Oh yeah, this is, this is my calling in life. Um, and... Uh, there are certain uh, jobs, professions, things that we, we match that with, um, where there's specific things. But sometimes people can just use that as whatever they feel like doing today. Well, that's my calling. Just trying to justify maybe behavior or attitudes. But Paul was saying calling not as a specific profession, not as a, a specific task, but an identity. An identity founded on who they are in Christ Jesus. So this general idea of being called to be Christ-like. So he's saying, if you know your identity in Christ, you should live according to that calling. Not wavering, not changing, not bending to circumstance. But to continue in that. To continue to live well in that. 
Jesus gave his disciples clarity in their mission at the end of his journey, right before his ascension. He told them to be what? To be witnesses. The witnesses of what he'd done. To declare the evidence of what they've experienced of Christ. It's a calling that continues in the church. To declare the evidence of our experience of who God is through knowing his word, through prayer, through devotion to him, through seeing him work through the church. And he tells them that they will go out to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. A pastor once told me that for a church to succeed, they have to identify clearly what is their Jerusalem. We are not living in Israel right now. But to Jerusalem, to the early disciples, was their home base. This is where they lived. This is where they were established. He says, this is where you will be my witnesses. But you are to move beyond just the comfortable places, to move beyond where you're just familiar and you're okay with, to move outside of that. And so to Judea, to the people that are right around you in this nation of Israel, but also to Samaria, which some of the disciples would have went, whoa, wait a minute, we have to go to them? I don't really like them. They're not quite like us. They're somewhat like us, but they're not really like us. But Jesus says, no, you're going to go to them. And then you're going to go to the ends of the earth. So the pastor says, as Christians, as churches, we have to identify what fits our parameters of those. Who is our Jerusalem? Who is our Judea? Our Samaria today that we are being called by God as the church to reach, to go out to, to display this worthiness that we have been called to in a meaningful way. But Paul doesn't tell them just to do that and then leave them with the ambiguity of, how or in in what way they should do it, he clarifies them for the demeanor that they ought to have in doing it. The text says in verse 2, with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. And then there's another one, but we'll get to that one in just a moment. Verse 2 clarifies how they are to be doing this in their disposition and their attitude. To do it with humility, Paul reminds the church in several places in in his letters, in Romans and Philippians, of having the right mindset. Romans 12, 3, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measures of faith God has given you. Philippians 2, 3, do not, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Paul was urging the church not to get raised up and be like, oh, well, we are so great and we have all the answers in such a way that it turns people off from hearing the gospel. But to recognize that the church is comprised of people who are still figuring things out. We're still in the journey ourselves. We've not arrived at perfection. We're still learning. We're still growing. We still make mistakes. We don't like to admit it, but we still do. And to have that disposition of showing people that we are here to journey alongside as we wrestle through what is happening in our world, what is wrestling through what happens sometimes within our own midst, within our families, within our friends. So we don't come off as prideful, but as those who want to be in the journey to help others succeed also. And to do that with gentleness, a demeanor and attitude that that is caring upon others, that is not harsh, that is not critical in the wrong way, Every now and again, we do need constructive criticism. Constructive criticism is helpful. The debrief and hearing from people and saying, hey, you know, you could do this differently or we could improve in this way. But if it is done out of, of maliciousness, it often can be really hurtful. When it's done out of gentleness, out of trying to build the other up, it can usually have a great impact to see people... Gentleness can also be described as meekness. Meekness is best described as power under control. Jesus is often described as meek. Not weak, but meek. That he had all the power and yet he had it under control in a powerful way that demonstrated his love for humanity. And then with patience. Patience, waiting on God's timing. Giving people the benefit of the doubt, not lashing out the first time something goes wrong, but recognizing that the Christian journey, the the work of the church, is a long haul, not a short sprint. 
and then obviously bearing with one another in love. 1 Corinthians 13 is, is, is a great passage that describes love. It is sandwiched between two passages that talk about the gifts of the church. I don't think that's unintentional by Paul. I don't think that he was just doing that um, aimlessly. He was saying that as we serve, if we miss the point about love and caring, we miss the point altogether. He compares it to himself in a clashing symbol. You know, if you hit a symbol, most people, what do they do? They cover their ears if you hit it too loud and they're close by because they're just reverberations hurt. So we do it with love. Doesn't mean we give in. Doesn't mean that we ignore truth. But it means that we seek to show love in the way Christ did. And all of this, hopefully, builds up the second aspect of what we see, which is the unity of the church. That we're being drawn together in working together for the same sake. That we're working in the same direction. Not all doing the same thing. Rob highlighted that last week, right? Unity does not mean uniformity. The way that I might do something will be very different than somebody else. And it doesn't mean that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. It just means that we have a different way of going about it. And if our goal is to glorify God then hopefully that is what is achieved. Hopefully it's achieved well. But when we talk about unity, we must have the right idea about who is in charge. Because if we think that we are the ones in charge, we miss the boat. That's why the first part of our statement of faith says, we believe in the holy Christian church, the body of which Christ is the head. If we miss the point that Christ is the head of the church, we will often then put our own desires, wants, our own priorities, what we think we should be doing, ahead of seeking what Christ would have us do. Christ is the source of the church. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. We explored that verse in, in more detail back in the summer when we went through the series of Colossians. The reminder that, church was the, or that Christ was the one who founded the church through his sacrifice and establishing the church. If we have the wrong idea about the source and the ownership of the church, we will fall into the missteps of thinking it's about us, forgetting that it's about Christ. Now, when we talk about the word church, we have to talk about it on two dynamics, and we highlight both of them in our um, um, statement. There's the, we call it the big C church, which is the, the body of Christ, which is the universal church which we define in our, our statement as we believe in that all who made, it conscious, made conscious of their sin repent and such profess faith with the Lord Jesus Christ are made instantly indwelt and sealed with the Holy Spirit and thereby made members of Christ's body, the church. There's the universal church, the larger church that exists. The church that exists around the world and some of which we will never ever meet, but who serve Christ who are working together for the, the gore, glory of the gospel. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, believed in him and were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Greeks or Jews, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit can sometimes be a challenging aspect. I don't know about you, but if you ever read the news and you hear about things that happen in other churches, particularly it seems like the news often reports when bad things happen in other churches, it's a challenge. You hear about what's going wrong or the, the breakdown of relationships or, or sins that are committed out of the church, and it affects our witness, and it can be a challenge. There can be groups that promote hypocrisy and hateful expressions who call themselves the church and yet they seem far from it and yet we hope and pray that they too will come to repentance and hope in Jesus Christ that they will desire to live for Christ Paul highlights this universal aspect of, of oneness in the second part of the passage this morning from Ephesians chapter 4, highlighting the one body and one spirit, the one Lord and one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. 
That though the church was growing in different, different parts of it, and Paul himself was bringing the message to some of them, but other disciples had gone out and were preaching the gospel, that though they were spread out across the land and the gospel message was going across the world, it was one church in different locations, all seeking to glorify God. I think it's great when churches can come together across different faith expressions, Evangelical churches working together to bring glory to God. It's one reason why I'm excited to partner with Richmond Park on this comedy night. There's a certain minimum tickets that um, we're hoping to sell. And it's great to bring other churches together to say, hey, for this night we can come together and be the body of Christ, laugh together, enjoy each other's company, and to be hopefully built up together as the church. The larger church, the universal church of Jesus Christ. But then there's also the, 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 the inverse, which is the functional side of the church and how we function independently. And that means the second part is the local church. We believe in the necessity of the local church as a place of worship, fellowship, teaching, and service. We believe that each local church should be an autonomous body operating under the headship of Christ. I really love the emphasis that is placed here on what we should do in our function to worship, fellowship, teaching, and service. Draws to the attention what the early church did in Acts chapter 2. Now, sometimes we can be like, oh, if we could just get back to being like the, the early church in Acts chapter 2, um, we, you know, we'd, we'd really see the, the movement of God in the way they did. Um, I don't know that we'd want all that they experienced. We'd like the good things, probably not the bad things, like being imprisoned over and over again. But it's, not, it's great to note what they were devoted to. It says, and they devoted themselves in verse 42 to 47 to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, they attended the temple together. And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We can see the aspects of what we desire for our function as the local church within this passage of worship, of being together, worshiping, of being individuals who worship daily in what we do. Not just on Sunday morning when we gather. I love gathering on Sunday mornings. I love being together and visiting and connecting with people. But our worship extends beyond the walls of the church. Our worship extends into every facet of what our life is as Christians. And then fellowshipping. Who doesn't like to share in fellowship with one another? Who doesn't like a good meal? I think everybody I, don't, everybody I talked to enjoyed the meal last week. Um, you know. Baptist and fellowship just means food, right? <laughs> Fellowshipping, right? Being together to, to build one another up, to connect with one another, to come alongside one another when they need it, to teaching of good instruction, of clarifying God's word, of hearing what God has for us, of going deeper in our knowledge, and then that translating into service, of caring for one another. And to not give up on that. The writer of Hebrews had to encourage the church sometime after, um, as the, the, the message was going out, as some were neglecting already the meeting together. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not n neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as the day draws near. To not give up meeting together, of being together. The phrase stir up is an interesting one. It's the only time that it's used apart from the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, it's actually used in a negative sense of like prodding one another or irritating one another. I'm really good at irritating other people. 
my older siblings would account for that. My children would probably, even Joy might even say that. Yeah. It's a talent of being the youngest in your family, right? You learn how to push buttons, right? You learn how to push people's buttons and get them just really riled up. A little bit of the sense that the writer of Hughes is, is to get people riled up for the sake of the gospel, not so that they are angry, but so that they are excited, so that they're hopeful, so that they're prepared to go out and to be effective. When we come together, it shouldn't just be to pat each other on the back and say, great job, but it should also be, what is God doing in your life? How can you be more effective? What can you do to help grow the gospel in your midst? There's a last part of the, the statement up there, um, which is very, very Baptist in its influence. The, the use of the word autonomous. Um, that as we function as the church, we do it under the headship of Christ, but as we as a group together determine congregational church, that we together are determining, deciphering, of learning, of seeing the vision that God will have for us, for our community, for our city. And likewise, the necessity to to state our position between us and those who have authority in our midst, the church and the state. We believe that the church and state each have specific mandates from God and function best when each is free from undue influence by the other. That we function on our own. We sh- are excited to share in our denomination. I don't know about you, but I was excited to hear about the things that were happening in our denomination last week. It was exciting to hear about the ways God is, is drawing churches that, again, function differently, have different ideas, sing different songs, accomplish their mandate differently in their local context, but to hear about how in the, the CBWC God is at work. God is growing his church through the ministries that we can share in. And then there's the relating to our world around us, the church and the state. I'm fascinated by the response of Jesus, and this came up at small group this week too, but Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 22, the Pharisees were trying to entangle him. They're trying to, to get him to, to stumble and to admit something that people would arrest him for. And so they come to him and they It says the Pharisees went and plotted to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? See, they were hoping Jesus says, No, don't pay taxes to Caesar because then somebody named Caesar was going to be really mad. And then he would take out Jesus for them. And they could say, hey, it wasn't our fault. Somebody else did it. Jesus, knowing, aware of their malice, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for tax. And they brought it to him, a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Then they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God." These people who came to entangle Jesus to try to trip them up and, and, and get him into a situation that would have been bad. It says, and when they heard it, they marveled and they left and went away. They came with ulterior motives and they left impressed by God. The idea of balance of church and, and our, our state and our responsibilities is one that has been a struggle since the beginning in the early churches. Paul dealt with it in Romans 13, reminding them of the authority of those over them, a reminding of God's function there, let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those who exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. On the flip side, you look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5. And when they brought them, they sat before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. So there's this kind of dynamic of balance that we have to strike. That we have to listen and follow the laws of our land. We also are accountable to God. And we hope it never comes to the point in our land and in Canada where we have to choose between speaking the gospel and what other consequences there are. 
But we know that there are those around the world who face this challenge right now. We have to pray for them, for the persecuted church, for those who are dealing with the consequences of when their faith comes in question by the authorities over them. Ultimately, we are to see the authority of Christ. That Christ, before he gave the commission to his disciples, reminded them of the authority that he had, the authority over all things. And so we, as a church, we are called, as Paul states in this passage, to walk worthy, of being good citizens, of living up to the call and displaying and functioning in unity under the authority of Christ, of making sure that we as the church are not too comfortable that we think everything is perfect, but that we also don't think that everything is going sideways and we miss out on where God is at work. And so we need to be well at evaluating ourselves, of doing the honest assessment of where we are. My mentor would often say that examining the church always was like examining the contrast between our spiritual needs and our physical needs, particularly if we are caring for one other. So he'd often say, you know, imagine you're caring for, for a small child, right? Um, and you have to provide for their physical needs, and you would evaluate how you're doing, and you would look at it under a number of categories. Number of categories. Are they getting physical nourishment? Are they consuming what they need to be nourished? And so on a physical side, we would look at that as food, making sure they're getting the food. In some cases, vitamins and other things that we need to take to, to help us along. For the churches, are we feeding ourselves on God's word? Are we those who are taking in the nourishment we need from God's word? Are we experiencing his word daily? Are we allowing it to impress upon our life? Is the bread of life truly what is providing for our sufficiency? So number one, we'd look at physical nourishment. Number two, we'd look at warmth and love. Is the child receiving the warmth and love that they would need? We as a church, are we displaying warmth and love to those around us? Not just those we are familiar with, not those who we are comfortable with, to, but all, to all that come into our midst. Are we displaying that warmth and love? When somebody new comes in, are we greeting them well? Are we hoping somebody else does it so we don't have to? And then exercise. Exercise. Kids need to burn off energy. Daylight savings does not go well with children. We learned that this morning. We're always reminded of that, but this morning, Caleb, at 5 a.m., he thought it was time to go. No, it was not time to get up, bud. It's time to go back to sleep. Kids need to exercise. They need to burn off their energy. They can have a lot of it. They need to be exercising, of, of using that energy for something or else it'll often go to waste. We as Christians exercise our faith through prayer and through witnessing. When we become complacent and we don't use it, we wonder why we don't see results. We don't see the kingdom growing, and yet God has tasked us to be his witnesses, to be dependent on him and the Spirit's power working in us and witness. And then kids need discipline and training. They need to be given boundaries and parameters to work within. They need to be given the right structure. As a church, we ought to be providing spiritual discipline. To be providing people with the right tools and options to grow. To be giving them that which helps them to support and grow in their faith. And the opportunity as a church to be built up together. And then number five, elimination. If you're taking in nourishment, there's a consequence to that. There's something that ends up happening with our bodies in our functions. For the church, that's confession. That's dealing with sin. There's a marked change in churches that are churches that are confessing churches, that are willing to own up individually and corporately to when they've fallen short, to seeking reconciliation and the growth of the gospel, that often a great hindrance to the growth of a church is being willing to confess that they've fallen short, that they are not always doing things as well as they can. 
And that comes through both personal confession as well as corporately together. The safest place to admit that we're falling short should be within the walls of the church because we are building each other up. We are there to support and to strengthen, to come alongside and to lift up a brother or sister who is struggling. But so often it seems like it's the place we're most afraid to be open about what's going on in our lives. How sad that is. So we ought to be a church that confesses and that supports those who are going through that. And lastly, kids need rest and sleep. And so too does the church needs to find rest in Christ. We can often find ourselves busied by activity of trying to do one more thing. And if we just do one more thing, then everything will be okay. And yet often what we truly need is to rest in Christ to trust in his sufficiency, to trust in his perfect plan. That's not to absolve ourselves and to say, oh, well, you know what, God's got this, I don't have to do anything. But it's to say that we must find that balance. We must find strength that comes only through finding rest in Christ by letting him to be sufficient so that in all these ways that we are walking worthy of the calling, that we are being the church rather than attending church, that we're being transformed into the image of Christ together, being built up as the bride of Christ so that ultimately he is glorified and praised in the work that we are doing. So that we can be proud and encouraged, we can glorify God in all we do, and that what we say matches what we do in a powerful way that brings testimony and to glory to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your church. We thank you for the promise, Lord, that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church, not through our power, but through the power of Jesus Christ, Lord. And so, Lord, would we be a church that desires to honor you in all that we do, a church that desires to walk in your glory and in your truth, Lord, that is willing to deal with the hard things, the challenging things, the hurtful things. That is real and genuine, Lord, before you. That we can be stirring one another up, Lord, to love and good works. To helping each one to be strengthened and to be supported. Not, Lord, for our own glory. Not so that we can feel good. But that we would be having a godly impact in our world. That we'd be seeing lives transformed for your sake to see healing in our midst, physical, spiritual, emotional, mental healing that comes only through the power and the name of Jesus Christ. So Lord, would you allow us to go and to be the church, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Lord, we will only do this by your spirit and by your power, so may we rest in you, may we be strengthened in you, and may we see your glory abundantly. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray.